Welcome, everybody. I am joined here by Mr. Greg Street, a.k.a. Ghostcrawler, once again, but this time under a different banner. Last time I spoke to him, we were talking about the Riot MMO. This time, we get to talk about the Ghost, codename Ghost MMO, um, under the Fantastic Pixel Castle banner. And I do want to give a major shout out to not only Greg, but also his team, Fantastic Pixel, Pixel Castle for allowing me this opportunity once again to talk to Greg. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Greg, uh, could you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what's going on here? Yeah, I mean, I'm Greg. I started a new game studio this year. Um, we're about 15 to 17 people now. We're making an MMO. Um, super exciting like one of the one of the things i've always cared a lot about is talking to players and now that there is you know now that i don't really have a boss i can talk to players as much as i want so it's kind of fun not having um pr people say what you can say or not say yeah absolutely i just i do want to uh i do want to start this interview by letting you guys know that i do have a lingering cough i'm gonna try my best to try and mute it or cough away from the mic uh so i do apologize for that i i i was sick earlier so um, Greg, I, uh, asked your team if it, if, if they needed to, if they needed me to send my questions and talking points to you ahead of time. And they said that I, I, I don't need to. So I did it because I thought it would be better to, um, get a genuine reaction and, you know, like a, um, natural, I guess more natural, less prepared, uh, answer. So, um, yeah, I just want to give you a heads up. <laughs> Honestly, that's what I prefer, just for mm -hmm. the reason you said. Um, okay. Sometimes people feel like they have to send the answer, <laughs> the questions to you ahead of time, but I, you know, yeah. I, it's more fun for me to to catch them on the fly. Right, right. Well, I'm excited. Thank you once again for this opportunity. I do obviously want to talk a lot about your MMO. And um, before we get into this, though, I would like to ask you this, just for a little bit of clarity, and just so you know, if there's anything you don't want to answer, feel free. But you know, me, my job as a journalist or content creator, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm just gonna ask. So I do apologize if I cross any lines. I don't think I will, but no. um, uh, because we've spoken before and everything, so I'm pretty sure we'll be okay with it. You left Riot, okay? You left yeah. Riot, and the from our understanding was that you left Riot because of family stuff going on. And uh, yeah. obviously, I'm, I'm I'm sure that all of that uh, worked out. However, immediately after, it was like, oh, you know, I'm stepping away because family stuff. But then it was like, all of a sudden, oh, I'm also starting this MMO with this new team. So my question to you is, I'm sure the real life stuff had a lot to do with that decision, of course. But yeah. was that decision to leave Riot, did it have anything to do with Fantastic Pixel Castle? If so, how much? Yeah, so kind of the the order of events. My my, I've I've, I've been pretty open about this. My brother and father passed away really <laughs> suddenly, and that threw my whole family for a loop. And I felt like I needed to take some time off and and focus on that. And I didn't feel like I was in a position to kind of be the the leader or the spokesperson for for the Riot MMO. Um, I parted on really good terms. I have a ton of friends at Riot. We talk all the time. I you know. I hope their game um, is successful. Worlds is coming up. I'm going to watch it like everyone else. Um, so I, I, I moved to Texas, which is where I am now, and dealt with the family stuff as much as you know, as much as you can. Some of it's mm -hmm. ongoing. There's just, I mean, there's a lot of paperwork. I don't recommend anyone in your family dying because it's just yeah. a lot of like, mm. there's a lot of forms you have to fill out. Yeah. Um, and then at some point, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do like now I need, I, you know, I wasn't ready to retire. Um, the town I live in is very small. If I wanted a job in this town, it would basically be like working with cows or something. Cause that's, that's all that's really going on here. And, um, I thought, you know, I thought about returning to riot and like, what would I do there? And I talked to some other companies. I talked to a lot of big studios that everyone's familiar with. I talked to like VCs about do we, you know, do I start my own company and what does that look like? And the offer I got from Netties was frankly a little nuts where they said, look, we would love for you to make your own studio and make whatever game that you feel inspired to make and we'll support you and we'll fund the studio. And we have all of these support teams that can help, but it's up to you if you use them or not. Like mm. there's not even an obligation to use them. And I said, this 
this really <clears> sounds <throat> too good to be true. I feel like I'm yeah. missing something. That was NetEase that had yeah. pitched you that. Yeah. So, so yeah. they came in and offered you this after you had stepped away from Riot. Exactly. And you're going through that. I knew system. I was a free agent and kind of thinking about what I wanted to do <clears> next. And by the way, there, you know, several other companies reached out and <clears> sure. and tried to make something like this work. But the the NetEase deal was by far the sweetest. And I'm like, okay, right. let's try it. Okay, so I was going to ask actually ask you about NetEase towards the end, but while we're on the topic, I would like to ask you about that dynamic. It does sound amazing. The way I yeah. I, I watched the 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 uh, broadcast that you guys had, and like you said, it sounds too good to be true. Yeah. If they are fronting that bill, though, I'm sure it comes with some kind of power in their on their side though it would or is that not how it works i'm just wondering like in the like in the beginning i'm sure it's all great but is there a possibility that in the future all of a sudden it's like hey 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 you know let's let's um you know we're gonna kind of step in here or no we we don't think we really want you to do that anymore or you know what i mean is can it turn yeah, yeah. into one of those situations yeah i mean i've been i've been doing this for a long time making games okay. like yeah things can change and Am I 100% certain that things are going to stay as good as they are now? Well, of course not. Like, maybe they change their minds. Maybe they decide this dynamic isn't working for them. I, I've seen no indication of that. Right. And, you know, it, it would it would, <clears throat> it would not be great public look for them to suddenly be like, oh, yeah, we right. changed our mind. We're not going to make these games after all, after we've been so <laughs> open about it. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm as confident, I think, as, as you can sure. be. There's, there's no certainty. But, it, I mean, they... They control the budget, like they are making an investment. And really that's the, the way we think about it is they're investing in our company. Right. And they are hoping for a return on that investment, but they're not going to say, you need to make this kind of game or, you know, they're not saying it has to be on mobile. And in fact, the game is not on mobile. Um, they're making no real requirements at all. They're offering advice where we want it. Sure. They've, they've made a lot of games and they do have a lot of expertise with MMOs in particular, but it's, I mean, it, like I said, it's, it's been great. And I did not realize how much in my career I needed that right now. I needed the, yeah. the creative freedom because I love Riot and I love Blizzard and I, I love Microsoft where I worked before that, but all big companies have these, these stakeholder relationships where some, you know, you have a boss and they have a boss and up at the top are these executives and they, you know, they, they come in sometimes and they make demands or they, they, they want confidence that what you're doing is right. And that management, that stakeholder management takes a lot of time. Yeah. And it has been so freeing to not have to deal with that, to just be like, let's focus on making the game. And NetEase really understood that. They said, making games is hard. We want to remove every distraction possible so that you can just focus on making the game. Right. It's, I, it's crazy. I, I saw Nikrit's recent video talking about it. I feel like he made a great example when he was talking about Tencent's relationship with Riot. Um, at the end of the day, Riot does make their own decisions and they've been doing a great job with it. Is it kind of similar to that type of thing that you Yeah, it was really think? similar. Tencent would say, hey, you know, here's this, I don't know. This other game in China tried this thing. Maybe you want to consider that for League of Legends. And sometimes we'd consider it and sometimes say, yeah, that's sure. that's that's not going to work. And they're like, okay. And it was great. Right. So it's yeah, pretty similar to that relationship. <laughs> Maybe I have even more creative freedom now that than I did um, with Tencent. But it's, yeah, it's pretty good. I, I think the, the fact that uh, we're able to do this just like even this for me, for, for those of you who don't know, I've, I've talked to Greg prior and uh, i remember our original interview that i had when you're under the ride banner i think that podcast was almost two hours and then when i actually published <laughs> it with all the cuts that i had to make it was like this is like a 30 minute podcast <laughs> i was like oh my gosh so the fact yeah i so i definitely can see that even from the perspective of a content creator your freedom and just being able to like even your last broadcast you guys were able to just speak and take questions and answer pretty freely so i think that's fantastic to see um yeah yeah so in regard so the last thing on netease that i that i do want to ask you is um it, it's it doesn't sound like you're really getting pressured by netease so that that sounds great i feel like that's extremely yeah. important for like the beginning of a professional relationship um 
If uh, anything, you- we're getting a little bit of anti-pressure. And what I mean by that is I'm impatient. I want to go. Yeah. You know, I want to make this game. And yeah. we feel like we have a really good head start. And Nettie's will caution us and say, <laughs> like, there's no rush. Like, there's no deadline. Take the right. time you need to do it right. And and I'll say, oh, I really appreciate that. That's wonderful. Yeah. But, you know, this is coming from within. We're not trying to hit a date. We just, you know, games take a lot of time. And so we want to get going. That was what I was going to actually uh, ask you. Is there a deadline? Not for you guys, but yeah. like from the perspective of NetEase, is there, do they have any type of deadline or a minimum that they're expecting? Or is it no. just straight up, hey, we, we, we believe you guys do it? Yeah, they believe. I mean, they're... What they would say is they're they're very picky about who they work with. Like they're not just gonna <clears throat> give anyone a studio. And and there's some other you know I have some other colleagues that that have studios with them now. Um, but they've even said like, hey, you know, if the first game doesn't work, let's make another game. Like making games is hard, and you try and you hope that the first game is a big hit. But you know sometimes it doesn't work out. And I that attitude is so unique and wow. so healthy. So they literally told you that they said. If this first one doesn't work out, we'll just try again. Yeah, yeah. No talk of like, oh, we're shutting the studio down or layoffs or anything. They're like, yeah, we'll try again. Sometimes the first game, you're just kind of learning the, you know, the IP or you're yeah. learning the engine or how the team gels. And sometimes it's that sophomore effort that really busts out. And, I, you know, I hope not. I want Ghost sure. to be a big fan. But I, I, the fact that they're willing to give us that much freedom and support, right. it's Crazy. I could totally picture that meeting that you have with them. They're like, oh, if you don't get it the first time and you're just, you know, Greg's just out there. He's like, do you not see my team? Like, what do you, what do you yeah. mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, do you not know who's on this team? What are you talking about? Uh, but that's awesome. That sounds that yeah. that sounds amazing. And I think that clears up a lot of questions that I personally had. Cool. I really wanted to know that dynamic and just the the vibe of it. Because like, you know, just me along with a lot of other people, we hear NetEase and we're like... Mm, you know what I mean? Like, but it sounds like that, um, that dynamic is, is pretty healthy and that's, that's really great to see. Yeah, that is. I mean, I I honestly had a lot of options. I didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen when I started looking for work. Um, I had a lot of options and this one was just, just a no brainer. So it wasn't like I was settling at all. It's like, this is, this is a, I've, (laughs) this is the happiest I've been in my career. And I've talked to so many of the other first party studio leads and they're they they'll say the same thing it's like right. this is the best setup they've had <clears throat> right okay so i do want to get into these questions because i i've got a lot and i don't think we're going to get through all of them i'm going to try my best to get through cool. all of these and i do I'll want not to be long-winded i can talk a no lot, you're so fine I'll try to get short answers you're totally fine um okay so the first thing i want to ask you about are these shards the blue shards yeah. and the red shards now I would love for you to help me try to understand how this is going to work and the inspiration behind it. And I'm just having a hard time really like I get the system, um, but I'm just having a little bit of a difficult time figuring out how it's going to work. So like immediately based off of what I heard in the broadcast was I'm thinking, okay, Red shards sounds like World of Warcraft. Yeah. Blue shards sounds like uh, V Rising or something along the yeah. lines of that. Yeah, exactly. Is 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 that an accurate representation of what's going on here? It, it's not bad. The 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 tweak I would say is it's still an MMO. It's not like you're switching genres or anything like that. Okay. Really, the genesis for the whole thing was older MMOs like. Um, you know, back in the day, going back to like Ultima Online, um, RuneScape, um, uh, even Star Wars Galaxies, made this <laughs> promise that you are going to be able to make a difference in the world. Like you as a player, you can go out there and make changes that will affect what's happening. You know, Ultima Online made this promise that if you go out and kill all the deer in the forest, the dragons are going to get hungry. So maybe they're going to come into yeah. your town. <laughs> and um, that was why a lot of us got hooked on MMOs. Over time, some of that has been filtered out. And there's there's good reasons it happened. Um, if you kill the boss and the boss stays dead, like what are all the other players going to do, right? Or we we got excited about building like V Rising or 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 Rust or or Valheim, but said, what does building look like on a on a zone with lots of other players? You're gonna have like, you know, 
it's going to look like this dense city of just all of these buildings together. And then you're going to have people like, you know, making phallic symbols or bad words or, or just interfering with the environment you want to create. And that's when it kind of clicked that maybe the answer is just to have both public servers and private servers, and certainly not the first game to come up with the idea of private servers, but really try to mix that together, where in the private server, you're in control. If you want it just to be you and your friends and you do whatever you want, that's cool. If you want to let a lot of people in and have a little more chaos, that's cool too, but but you're in control of that. Right. But in order to get that big, massively multiplayer feeling that we all love, we also need zones that are epic and they're handcrafted and there are world bosses and puzzles and 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 rare spawns and things like that where there are a lot of other people. But because they're not permanent, they respawn in the way Final Fantasy, you know, enemies respawn, you 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 won't have that, you won't be able to put your fingerprint on it, but it ensures that everyone will have a, a good time. You don't have to worry about, oh, right. someone killed the ball. Now it's gone for everyone. Okay, so we've got these two different shards. Part of what I personally love when it comes to MMOs is that I'm in this world. My character, yeah. I'm immersed. Having this system, do you think it's going to cause a bit of a disconnect for that type of ex with that type of experience? Because you have people that are now scattered. It's not, you know, like in in Black Desert or Lost Ark within your server. I know. I know these uh, games have channels, but like World of Warcraft, you're in your server. Everyone's there. You know, you're you're there. You're somewhere in that world. Do you think having these 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 um these blue shards are going to make a cause a disconnect and have players kind of scattered to where the red shard maybe doesn't feel as massively multiplayer anymore, and maybe it starts feeling like, hey, this is just where you go to to experience the theme park content, and then it's back yeah. to the blue shards. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, all of these are risks, and it's the kind of thing we're going to have to play test and further the design and, and get feedback on. Our hope is that the people you hang out with, your group, your guild, the people you like to play with, they're probably in the blue shard with you, and you all are doing stuff and having mm -hmm. fun. And once in a while, you need to make an expedition into the red zone. Like, Someone <clears throat> says, hey, I need a, a reagent to finish this recipe I'm working on. Or someone mm -hmm. says, hey, I'm, I'm looking for this rare drop. And someone told me the boss just is is up. Or you want to, you know, you want to go raid or you want to do something like that. You you all get together and you're like, okay, we're going to go out into the red shard. Maybe we're going to die. It's going to be tough. And then we'll bring our spoils back to the blue shard and kind of use that to in, invest in the community we're building there. Right. Because even when you're playing World <clears throat> of Warcraft, the reality is... Your friends are probably scattered in lots of different right. zones and doing lots of different dungeons. And you're talking to them. You're probably in, in Discord or something chatting with them. And then periodically you're like, okay, everyone can get together now and let's go, let's go do a dungeon. But you're not shoulder to shoulder with them all right. of the time. The structure of these shards, is it going to feel like um Hey, I'm in the red shard right now. I want to go to this blue shard. It's gonna, is it going to literally feel like I'm selecting a server and I'm entering it like some kind of first person shooter or like V rising type of game? Or is it going to be a little bit more connected to a world where it feels like I'm entering a part of the world that kind of puts me in this blue? Like, how, how is that transition going to work? Yeah, we really want to avoid the list of servers because that, I think that really takes you out of the world it and does. that feels. It feels like you're playing UI at that point. Yeah. Um, we want it to feel more natural of, you know, maybe somebody opens a portal and then you can jump through the portal to get <clears> to the <throat> other, you know, to get to the other zone. Okay, okay. And we've even talked about, and again, this is super rough, so we don't know sure. how it'll work, but imagine when you make a portal to go to the red shard, you have to put specific stones into this portal. And if you put in like the gold stone and the blue stone and the green stone, that'll open a portal to a particular red shard. So there's a little more, it's it's more in game than just picking a list off a server. Gotcha. Okay, cool. I just didn't want like that Im immersion to break. You know, it's like I'm exactly, playing an exactly. MMO. Yeah. Um, and we don't want, if we can at all avoid it, we don't want a loading bar. Right. Like um, we aren't exactly sure how travel from shard to shard works yet. Maybe it's a portal you step through. But <clears throat> sure. another idea I heard that was kind of exciting is like, when you're in Super Mario Galaxy and you're going to a different planet, Mario just kind of jumps up and flies right. through space, then lands on the new planet. And so there's no there's no loading bar that comes up, you know? Right. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. That would definitely make the experience better. 
The other question- The new Spider-Man does a great job at that too. Like when you want to mm. fast travel, you just appear in the new spot. There's not like right. a bar and cut scenes or anything. Yeah. I'm definitely excited to see how you guys design that, um, that system of connecting the blue and the red shard. I do yeah. have another concern about these shards though, or not so much a concern, a little bit of a concern. I'm just kind of curious as, how, as to how this is going to work. One of your members, one of the team members mentioned during the broadcast that, you know, blue shards, uh, you know, maybe you can, you know, full loot somebody or, you know, it, it's kind of mm -hmm. has its own rules. Yeah. How is that going to tie in with overall progression? Because it sounds like there will definitely be vertical progression in this game, as I, I, I think that's a massive W. But if you have these custom rules on these blue shards to the point where people can... Like, I'm just going to create a blue shard where experience rates are juiced out 9,999%. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, have a drop rate that's insane and then take it back to the red shard. Red shards. Like, how, how does that dynamic work? So you, you don't have full control over, over the rules. You have rules that you can apply. So for example, you might have a decision. I mean, you'll probably have a decision of how big do you want the shard to be? And okay. going back to my example of the building the portal, if you use a pebble, it makes a little, a little zone. If you use a rock, it makes a medium-sized zone. If you use a boulder, it makes a giant zone. But you don't have a scaler where you drag it in between. Mm -hmm. Likewise, you might apply a rule mm -hmm. that says experience is doubled. But maybe that rule also says, but death is permanent or something like that. So you, you don't have, mm. it's not like creating your own game. Right. Um, I compare it sometimes to, uh, I don't know, you know, in Halo, I don't know if they still do this, at least originally, you would find skulls as you explore the map. And then you can apply the skulls to kind of make the experience harder or more different. Right. Um, Hades did this a lot too. You'd find these rules and apply in the future and it would it would change the experience in some ways. We're thinking more along that route um, okay. rather than someone can just make this weird server that showers you with loot. <laughs> right, and then the other right. thing I'd say about that is it's kind of okay if the loot you're getting showered with is like green items, the occasional blue items. And then to get the good stuff, you have to go into the red shards or into the dungeons and raids to get the really good loot. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. I do want to talk about that progression content, but really quick while we're still on the blue and red shards yeah. servers, because one of the things that were mentioned, it like someone asked in the, your broadcast about like Aussie servers, and it sounded like you guys were almost going for kind of like a, a mega server or something. I'm not sure. Could you, could you kind of explain how the server system is going to work with the blue and red shards. Are blue shards going to also be in like specific locations? How does that work? We would love to like a big goal for ghost is to be able to play with your friends. Yeah. And it really sucks when you jump into an MMO and you're like, well, what server are you on? Oh, I'm on a different server. Maybe yeah. we're not going to be able to play together. We would love to get rid of the notion that there are servers. Like you shouldn't roll up a character and then get a list of like, what server do you want to be in? Right. You should just jump in the game and play. And if you want to play with your friends, you, you know, you find your friends and play with them. Right. There are hardware limitations of we can't have like 5 million people in one place, but we mm. can spin off like extra servers when we <clears throat> need to kind of behind the scenes to, uh, you know, to make sure everyone has a good experience because you want enough players, but not too many on a, on a server. But I don't think we'll have permanent servers in the sense that like, oh, I play on Illidan and you play on, right. uh, you know, um, bronze beard or something i'm wondering in terms of like location i'm assuming that like the red shard is going to be like a set location or have set locations within the red red shard because i don't know how big it's going to be and then the yeah. blue shards might be kind of like more custom to the player's location kind of like how diablo 4 does it is that kind of what we're thinking here or the way we describe it is there are we don't have a great word for this yet we have biomes so you might say um Chapter one, which is kind of like our first season, maybe it's all snowy biomes and everything kind of feels like the, you know, the far north feels like um, Skyrim or something. And so both the blue and red shards would adopt that terrain. Okay. And then maybe in chapter two, we add a desert biome. And now in addition to going to the frozen areas, you also can go to a desert area and make it like that. Um, there is a nuance where the terrain in the blue zones is randomly generated when you when you make a okay. new one because we really think that exploration part is is a, is really key to the the survival feel like we don't want it just to be wicked where 
someone says, well, the first thing you do is you go into this cave and you kill the wolf and then you go over here right. and this is the, the right spot to build. We really like having to explore a little bit and figure out, are there wolves? Where are they living? Do they have something you want? Right. Um, that works really well, even in games like Minecraft. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, just so you know, I meant like location as in like physical location. Like I live in Korea. So like if I'm connected oh, right. to, a, so, yeah. yeah, but that was interesting. As, yeah. As a designer, I would love to say, yeah, there's no geographic boundaries. Realistically, there are some laws to follow around like data protection or taxes or, or dumb stuff like that, that we don't want to have to worry about. But right. I may not, you know, I can't make the bold claim that you'll be able to play with any player in the world on their servers. Like we may have to have servers in some some parts of the country. Like China would not surprise me if we have to have Chinese servers for Chinese players. But right. but we'll see. I, I couldn't tell you about Korea off the top of my head. Gotcha, gotcha. Understood. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about that progression content. You guys did mention that, excuse me, dailies you didn't really want to have this like daily system which by the way i thought was terrible for a game called arc age unchained you Ooh. arc age vanilla arc age was like the sandbox game and then all and you progress however you want you make currency however you want then all of a sudden it just became this daily age weekly weekly raids and it was just a terrible experience <laughs> could you tell me a little bit more about the progression because like in your game the blue shard so sounds like a survival sandbox and then the red yeah. shard sounds like a theme park like wow so like how is the progression going to work because those are two very different progression paths progression content types how does that yeah. work for a ghost it's a, it's an mmo at the end of the day so you will want to get better gear and probably will have you know white, green, blue, purple, something something familiar like that. Um, within the blue shard, you'll probably craft more gear than in the average MMO, just because the fiction is kind of that you're out in the wilderness and it doesn't mm -hmm. make as much sense that there's lots of NPC vendors around. So imagine you craft a lot of gear and periodically you need an important, you know, I need the magic crystal to finish my <laughs> breastplate and that can only be found in a red zone. So I'm gonna have to go to the red zone every now and then to get these, these rare <laughs> reagents to finish my gear. And then when you reach end game and you really want the good stuff, you want the, the, the purple weapons, well, that's probably in, in raids like it is in, in Final Fantasy or World of okay. Warcraft. And so you would do that. Um, the reason developers add Daily Quest, I mean, I worked on a game that added a lot of Daily Quest, is because players run out of content. They're like, I'm right. bored. Give right. me a reason to log in. Um, we think we have some reasons to log in. We want to have lots and lots of classes so we can have lots and lots of alts. We want to have this ability of like re-rolling or pushing blue shards. You keep making new ones with crazier and crazier rules and kind of see what that experience is like. Mm -hmm. But we're also okay with players just taking a break until the next kind of tier comes out. Like, hey, we're done. Rather than grinding our face into the ground, let's just take a break until until FPC makes makes new content. That's hard for subscription-based games because they really need to make sure players stay engaged with the with the with the game. Yeah. So in regards to that, I'd love to hear your thoughts on games like Guild Wars 2 and Final Fantasy 14, because mm -hmm. these two games on paper is like what everyone loves, what everyone wants. You know, it's not pay to win and, you know, all this good yeah. stuff, you know, but those two games also come with the stigma of having nothing to do. Now, I know I might get crucified right. for that comment because, of course, there is stuff to do. Of course, there's a lot of things to discover in Guild Wars 2. You guys, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just talking about from a vertical pro progression perspective because hor it's it's like horizontal content, right? There's a lot, you're, yeah. you're, like in Final Fantasy 14, you're done. Guild Wars 2, you're done with your gear and it's like cosmetics and all that other yeah. stuff. From a perspective of vertical co progression, you're, you're pretty much done. And a lot of players do feel like they run out of things to do. Is yeah. that something that you want to avoid? Or do you kind of like the idea of Guild Wars 2 and Final Fantasy 14, where it's like, hey, we'll you know, just take a break from our game and wait for our next update. And we'll be as fr you know frequent as we can when it comes to that. I think sometimes when players say what they want more to do is, is they're saying, we're kind of done with this raid content. Can you make another raid really quickly? And the answer mm -hmm. is... No, it's part, you know, raids are very expensive to make. And I don't mean right. money expensive. I just mean it takes a lot of time to get it right. You want to have a lot of good art. You want to have original bosses. You want to have a story that makes sense. So I don't think the right answer is, hey, we're going to make a new raid every month. That's just not realistic. So instead, you ask, like, well, what, what can we do to give players who 
aren't ready to put the game down more content to do. And I think that's where things like blue shards come in. It's where I just unlocked a new class. I want to try it out where, where things like that come in. And then every year or so we'll come out with a new, a new, a new tier with a new raid and, right. and things like that. So classic hardcore Diablo four, you have these games and I've been told, well, my experience with Diablo four, it really is the journey to level 100. It really is the journey to that level cap versus other games where it's like, no, 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 you got to hit the end game. Then the game starts like Lost Ark, for example, mm -hmm. you, you know, yeah. where does where does Ghost fall in line with that? Again, it's something we're going to have to play with a lot. I'm really hoping that the blue shard feature makes the level up experience more compelling. Okay. It's not, it can only be, even if the quests are really well written at the end of the day, it's often like, Hey, go kill six bears and then right. bring me this item. And, and, um, it feels like your friends are at the end game waiting for you and you just have to get there as soon as possible. Yeah. So I'm hoping the blue shards make that adventuring experience, um, more fun. At the other hand, like there are people that just want to, just want to raid <laughs> and they just want to get to the end game. So I don't think we'll throw up like silly blockers and say, well, it's going to be six months before you even are capable of stepping into the raid. Um, for example, maybe we have, you know, World of Warcraft has what, 60 levels at, at launch and then you do the end game content. Maybe we only have 30 levels and you do the end game content and then we add 10 more levels much, you know, in a in new content that comes out much faster than like the two years or so it, it took when I was on WoW. Right. Classes. Okay, so when I heard yeah. this, I was like, what? I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I heard you guys say that at launch, you were trying to come out with like 20 to 50 classes. Yeah, yeah. That sounds, I mean, it sounds great, by the way, to right. me, yeah. but it also sounds insane. Like it's not going yeah. to work insane. <laughs> because of because of class balance and just uh, just a lot of things, yeah. What, like, is it possible? Like, what, what do you what, walk me through this? What's happening here? Twenty to fifty? That's that's crazy. I think it's possible. the 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 fantasy we're trying to achieve is 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 <clears throat> maximum levels of diversity. So rather than having a warrior, you might have uh, a gladiator who's all about showmanship, or you might have. Um, a shield and spear warrior, or you might have a, a berserker who fights with an ax and, and no armor. Um, we're inspired a lot by games like um, Gloomhaven, Darkest Dungeon, even um, Pathfinder that tend to have classes that are a little more out there. They don't have, you know, Darkest Dungeon doesn't have a rogue. It has like a highwayman who has right. like a pistol. Right. Um, they don't have like a cleric. They have the, the they have, um, you know, what are the, what are the, Tanking classes as a leper, just right. You can have, you can do a lot more interesting things where getting a new class feels more different. Um, if I played a priest in World of Warcraft and then I unlocked the paladin, the healing is not that different. Yeah, the spells have different names and maybe the paladin's better at single target healing, but overall, they're not that different. We would rather be able to experiment a lot. And the reason I think that's possible is because I worked on League of Legends, which has right. freaking 160 champions now. Now, yeah. those only have four abilities and they don't have a lot of build diversity, but I feel like there's a sweet spot in between launching with like six or eight classes and 150 where we can have maybe not as many abilities as Final Fantasy, but still a lot of abilities and ways to customize yeah. your character, but still make it really fun when you unlock something new and you're like, how does this class work? I want to try that out. You don't think you're going to run into any significant balance is issues for both PVE and PVP if you're releasing this, these many classes at launch? I mean, almost certainly we'll run into a lot of balance issues. I mean, and it's impossible to be full, perfectly balanced, of course. Like, even, it is, it uh, is. Yeah, and, but... and balance is important. And I mean, I worked on balance for, for most of my career, but you can also focus so much on balance that you you smooth off all of the kind of fun, rough edges of the game. And you risk homogenization if you focus too much on balance, where you say, mm. oh, well, this character has a stun and that makes them very powerful. So let's nerf the stun or let's give everyone a stun. <clears throat> and right. both of those are, are, are kind of lame. You don't like um, that approach. Yeah, I don't like yeah. that approach. One of the things that works well in the MOBAs is your character might get banned. So you may not be able to play them. Or right. 
um, you probably have different characters. You may have a main, but you probably have other characters you can play as well. So we're hoping there's more of an element of that. Maybe you love, I don't know, let me think of a class real quick. Maybe you love to play the Dragoon. I don't even know what a Dragoon is, but say we have a Dragoon class. Um, but the Dragoon is not good in this particular dungeon. Well, you decide, screw it, I'm going to try anyway. Or you say, hey, I know the Dragoon's just going to slow you guys down. Let me switch to my, you know, my Hoplite instead, and I'll play them in this dungeon. But because we have a lot of shared items and shared progression, you're not really hurting yourself by not playing your main all the time. Gotcha. So it sounds okay. I I got you. What what about um? So I, I know you guys spoke on this a little bit, but it sounded like you guys want to obviously have different specialties and different roles for for every class. So how do, how would like tanks and healers and DPS carries? How would that fall in line? I guess when it, what I'm asking is uh, if you could explain a little bit more about your thoughts on Holy Trinity with with this game. Yeah, we're right now we're pretty certain we're going to be Holy Trinity. Um, we have a lot of experience with it. It works. It's it's a lot of what players are expecting. I'm nervous if we came up with a game and we said there's no healing in this game that you just lose like the 10 to 20 percent of players out there <laughs> that love healing and they just they want to play a healer. Right. Um, another way to think about it <clears throat> that I that I bring up a lot is if you want to make a game that takes less than like 10 or 15 or 20 years to make, you really have to call your shots on where you want to innovate. Mm. And so we would like to innovate with blue <clears throat> shards. We'd like to innovate with having lots of classes. We don't want to innovate on the Holy Trinity. We think it's good enough. Like, yes, gotcha. you could probably make another system that's better and games have tried, right. but we'll have the Holy Trinity. If you play a healer, maybe you're not as effective out soloing. Like, we'll give you a damage spell for sure, sure, but maybe that's not the most effective way to solo. Maybe you want to solo on a different class or you want to have a buddy that you run around with. Sounds um, like that's the only thing you're not trying to innovate, by the way. <laughs> well, there, there are other things as <laughs> yeah, well. Like, yeah, yeah. We're going to have dungeons and raids. We don't need to sure. innovate on that. We're going to have crafting. Um, mm -hmm. It'll probably be a bigger part of our game than in some. We like uh, Black Desert Online <laughs> as, as great crafting. Um so yeah, I, it's scary to innovate everywhere. And I think that's where a lot of games fail is they they get overly ambitious. They're like, every single feature we're gonna innovate on. And it just <clears throat> it just takes a long time. Right. When when we when we are talking about <coughs> excuse me, when we are talking about your the classes 20 to 50, are we talking about actual unique classes or are we talking about I know you don't have a warrior, but let's just say warriors in the game. Yeah. Are you talking about like warrior and then arms warrior, fury warrior, and those that counts as like two different classes? Are you talking about like the like the the secondary classes when it comes to like the twenty to fifty? I hope they're more distinct than that. One one idea we're playing with right now is that every class has a signature weapon, and they're the only class that has that weapon. Oh wow! So okay. if you find a harpoon, that's the weapon for a particular class, and no other class uses a harpoon. So right away. The, you know, the arms warrior, fury warrior thing doesn't fit. You would have to say more that, oh, this is an axe warrior and this is a like double wielding sword warrior. But even that, I think you'd want to push it further and say, this is a Viking berserker and this is a swashbuckler. And now you're, you know, right. now they have kind of unique kits, unique feels and um, different, different, different abilities. Like <clears throat> we don't need to have ability overlap in that world. We can give everyone their own abilities and they'll be, you know. Maybe every tank needs a taunt of some kind, and maybe every healer needs a area heal. But you know, the the arms warrior and the fury warrior have a lot of overlap in, in their abilities. Gotcha. Alts. It sounded like you guys were not going to do the Final Fantasy fourteen alt system, and it sounded more in line with, I guess, like World of Warcraft, where it's just a new character. A new character is its own class, a different yeah. alt. But at the same time, I remember one of your members mentioned that it would be possible to be like, hey, I'm in the middle of a raid. Let me just swap to my alt real quick and respec because it might be better for this. How does that work when you have an alt system like, well, like pretty much most MMOs where it's just a separate character? You mentioned that there's a lot of like, I guess, family bound items, items that you can share between your between your family of characters, your your yeah. roster. Could you walk me through how the all system is going to work a little bit more in detail? Yeah, so we we kind of start at the basics of what are the problems players don't like? You know, what are they trying to fix? Mm -hmm. A big one with alts is it sucks to log all the way out of the game and log all the way back in. Like you're missing chat. 
you don't know where your character was logged out. Maybe mm -hmm. your add-on <clears throat> don't work for both characters. Um, it sucks to have to do content over and over again. Like, oh, well, I got yes. to the reputation on this character. Now I need to do it on this other character. So our attitude is more, imagine almost everything is shared across characters. Like maybe oh. their inventory is shared. Like if you find a shield for one wow. character, you can give it to the other character. I mean, why not? Like, what are we scared of to try to try yeah, things right. like that? Yeah. So it almost the biggest sounds... fear is, is that maybe you don't play your other characters because, you know, they're already all progressed. But I think I think there's a sweet spot we can hit. So it, so it almost sounds like it it is kind of like the Final Fantasy 14 character, only they're separate characters because everything in Final Fantasy yeah, 14. And, it the, will... and the reason I personally like the idea of separate characters is it lets you try out different, you know, different looks for your character, different, mm. you know, we haven't exactly settled on, you know, race slash species, but assuming we have something like that, like if you only have one character, what reason is there to roll up whatever ends up being an elf in our game? Or, you know, you have one character that kind of presents male, but you want to play as a female looking character instead. Right. Um, why not? You know? Outside of just the class mechanics, is the experience going to be significantly different between classes? Like, are they going to have like different starting zones and stuff like that? Because you you did you did you did just mention that you know shared progression to a certain degree too amongst your all, so you yeah. don't have to redo your stuff all over again. But then, like, if you're rolling on another character that may potentially start in a different area and goes in, in the storyline, takes you through the lore of that class and race, yeah. you, you would have to kind of do that, right? So, like, how, how would that work? There's two, I think there's two problems with having, you know, unique starting zones. One is, right away, it makes it hard to play with your friends. Like, if, right. if you know, you roll up one race and I roll up another, we can't start playing from the very beginning. Okay. Um, the other one is, you end up making a lot of content for every every class. And if we're saying what's really important to us is have lots of classes, then that's probably something you have to sacrifice is mm. really unique starting zones for them all. And we'll look at it, but I think that's um, that's a... Um, right now, we think that's a, a, a cost we're willing to pay. There are things you can do where um, maybe you get a different dialogue option if you're a certain mm -hmm. class or, or you know characters react to you differently. So hopefully it'll feel meaningful. We don't want it to feel so interchangeable that it, it's irrelevant. It's just that every time you make a lot of unique content that throws up a barrier to adding more classes over time. Right. That's interesting. So it doesn't really sound like a different class that is a different race is going to have like a different progression path, like, like in World of Warcraft, for example. Yeah, that's our thinking right now is because we really want you to jump in and, and play. Now, that's not to say that the experience, the starting experience will be identical every time you play, because that sounds kind of lame. Like right. maybe we'll have you choose one of 10 starting zones and you, you go there. Or maybe you start in a blue zone right away so that it's already somewhat randomized and you don't know what to expect. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I want to talk about combat here. Yeah. Okay. Because it's not, I think Brian Holinka said that it's was not going to be action combat and it was going to be more of a hybrid. So immediately yeah. in my mind, I'm thinking hybrid. Okay. Guild Wars 2 kind of seems pretty hybrid, -y. even Wildstar to a certain degree. Can you tell me a little bit more about the combat that you guys are expecting to implement into your game? Is, is it going to be very similar to Guild Wars 2? Cause I personally think that Amongst all hybrid tab targeting games, Guild Wars 2 really nailed it. I thought the combat was fantastic in that game. Yeah, it's it's not a bad paradigm. I don't want to go too far down that road or people will say, oh, it's just a clone of Guild Wars 2, which, which it's not. Um, the reason we don't want to go full action often comes down to, if you think of a game like um, uh, God of War or, or Dark Souls, if you dodge, you take zero damage. Yep. And as soon as you make that decision, that means that <clears throat> gear matters a lot less than in an MMO mm. where if you don't have good enough armor, you're just not going to be able to fight this, this opponent. Right. Um, it also means the game could be very, very twitchy, which is fun, fun for some people, but not fun for others and makes, um, makes ping really, really matter and things like yeah. that. So again, at, at the end of the day, we want it to be, to feel like an MMO and we want a lot of that depth around, do I use a long cooldown now or, or, or that sort of thing. Where we think there's an opportunity in is just making the combat kind of look a little better. Um, in in World of Warcraft, 
you stand against the knoll or whatever, and you hit the knoll, and the knoll hits you, and you hit the knoll, and it, it looks really silly, and there's right. almost no motivation to move yeah. in, in the combat. Yeah. So we want to think a little bit more about maybe dodging is not something you do constantly, but maybe you have a dodge button that puts you behind the enemy and then lets you <clears> hit them for, for extra damage <laughs> from behind and, and things like that. Um, maybe we build up more, more uh, combo-like systems. Like Brian talks a lot about... Um, Spider-Man has a pretty simple combo system where it's usually like, you know, light hit, light hit, big hit. And then if you chain those together, you, you know, you get something cool out of it. Mm. We think there's opportunities to do that while still keeping the, you know, the long cooldowns and the kind of um, big bursts that are fun in, in MMOs. Speed. Pacing of combat is pretty important. A lot of people hate this GCD for Final Fantasy XIV's combat. Some people like yeah. it. You know, and, yeah. and if you play it enough, you'll notice that there are skills that are off the GCD, obviously, and it makes it a little bit higher APM. But yeah. Final Fantasy fourteen notoriously known for its GCD. Yeah. How fast are we expecting your combat to be? So the, the reason games often have GCDs is to prevent, prevent, you know, flooding the server. Like, at the end of the day, the server needs to be the arbiter of did this attack land or not? And if players are just sitting there mashing their keyboards, it, it's hard, you know, you're, you're, you're creating enormous um, pressure on the server to be able to, to figure out what's going on. And so when you have the GCD, it means that you can only issue a command every 1.5 or three seconds or whatever the GCD right. is. Um, on the other hand, like, we don't want a game where hitting the button as fast as you can is the way to win. Like. Right. Part of what is fun about role-playing game combat in general, including MMOs, is making smart decisions of, okay, the boss is going to hit me really hard. I need to pop a cooldown. Or my buddy, you know, if I, if I cast this buff on my buddy right now, that's going to have a, a big impact. So you do need enough space in the game to be able to react to those, to be able to notice they're happening, right. maybe even to, like, communicate to your allies. Um, again, I think... League of Legends does a pretty good job of this, where the combat could be fast-paced, but not so fast-paced that you can't communicate, that you can't say like, hey, we're going to go gank that dude now, or I'm going to blow a really big, I'm going to use my ult, and so you know, you should be able to follow up on it. I think things like that feel better than just the more damage you do is the faster you can hit the keyboard. Right. What about the amount so we wanted of... To feel, I guess a, a way to answer it is we want there to be enough time to talk to players and to evaluate the the battle about what's going on without it constantly being well you can't do anything because everything's on cooldown right gotcha i understand what yeah. about the amount of abilities you have available to you guild wars 2 you don't have that many i think you have like what uh eight you have eight different skills active on the weapon with including the swap and then like four passives and an ultimate and a heal i think something like that yeah. what like are you it, are, with with Ghost, are you thinking, hey, we're gonna allow you to have like, effing, you know, forty abilities at your disposal, and it's gonna really like, you know, your decision on which one to use is going to matter, and you should really know your class, and that raises the skill skill ceiling, skill cap, or is it gonna be a little bit more simpler, and it's gonna be like, hey, you know, actively you're gonna have like four spells available, and you can combo these in in any way you like, or something like that. Yeah, I think. It's probably not going to be as few as four. Like it'll be more than a MOBA, but it'll probably be fewer than like the 30 or 40 or whatever you have in a <clears> high level <throat> World of Warcraft character. Um, we do think the combos give you a great opportunity. Um, a lot of MMOs don't, don't do much with that, right. but a lot of console games do. And you can get a lot of depth out of what, you know, Street Fighter gets a ton of depth out of like, which, you know, which button am I going to hit <laughs> next? And can I execute this, this combo chain? So right now we're experimenting a lot more with you have a light attack, you have a heavy attack, and then you have some other abilities. You might have an interrupt, you might have a, a big cooldown, things like that. And then it's how you use all of those together. Like if you use light attack, light attack, heavy attack, maybe it makes your next attack an instant crit so or, or an automatic crit. So you decide, do you want to use a heavy attack or do you want to use your big, you know, 12 second cooldown right then? And right. we think there's an opportunity there to add a, a lot of depth. Gotcha. Again. League of Legends only has four abilities, but they it's a lot more than that when you consider that, well, after you use this ability, it turns yeah. this ability into something else. It keeps the number of buttons on your UI relatively small, but mm -hmm. there's still a, a ton of depth to the combat.
we have to have depth. That's just right. Uh, you know, that's not fun if there's not a lot of interesting decisions. Is there going to be like a spammable skill like light attack and heavy attack where you could just constantly use that has no cooldown as a filler skill? Or is that kind of what you're Maybe, thinking? Or no? yeah. Maybe. We like the sound of that because it gets rid of the GCD thing and gives you something that you can always be doing. Yeah. But again, we'll we'll have to experiment more to see, you know, see how that feels. And, you know, is it too spammy? Is you do feel like right. part of the problem with World of Warcraft is anytime you're not using your auto attack, you're kind of losing a lot of DPS. And that yeah. makes it hard for you to you know, want to run out of battle and do something or, right. you know, imagine how cool it'd be if you could run over and, and re you know, just click on a fallen enemy and bring them back kind of, um, I mean, Baldur's Gate does this, a lot of games right. do that, but it'd be really hard in a game like World of Warcraft because it's hurting your DPS so much to do that. Right. Gotcha. Um, one of the things that wasn't mentioned, unless I completely missed it, because I think like the, the broadcasts are always super late for me. Like even now it's like five in the morning, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yes, one of the things that I don't think was mentioned was trading, trading in yeah. marketplace. I would love to hear what you guys are going to do in regards to the marketplace and player versus player to player trading. I mean, I think it's really hard to have a social experience without player to player trading, just point blank, like saying, Hey, I have something. Do you want it? I'll trade it for you. Oh, you're an expert crafter. Can you make this thing for me? Like we really want to have a, a player based economy. <clears throat> what I'm skeptical about right now is having some kind of auction house, because I think auction houses actually get in the way of the social interaction. Like mm. when you go to an auction house, you're just getting stuff. You don't really, care who the other player was right. it could be an npc listing those <laughs> items so um that's something we're gonna we're gonna experiment with about and and certainly for the building aspect of the game you have to just pretty much have very easy trading because right if someone chops a bunch of wood and they want to hand it to you to build sure. a wall like that can't be you know that should probably be as simple as you throw the wood on the ground and they can right. pick it up right so what the moment you introduce trading which i i also am a big fan of trading as well mmo guy but the moment you open that door, you're also opening the door to, to bots. Yeah. Is, is that something that you guys, like, how are you going to remedy it? Because that almost feels like it's impossible to, <laughs> to get rid of all your bots. It's like this just constant battle, the seesaw, where it's like you up your game against bots, and then they figure out a right way around it, and then you do that, and it's just you're back and forth. How do you combat that with yeah. open trade? I mean, it's an arm race for sure, and I don't think there's any, like, oh, we came up with a super clever <clears throat> solution and now we're not going to have that problem anymore. Right. I think it's a matter of making sure that you don't... You could be so worried about bots that you kind of make a bad experience for players. Like right. we could say, we're not going to have trading in our game because that prevents bots, but then then you're taking out trading in the game. Right, so that's what Black Desert I don't did. know if there's a better <laughs> solution than it's going to be an arms race. If we see that we made a design decision that makes botting very exploitive or is kind of ruining the game for people then, you know, then we'll think about what, you know, what we can do about that. We think a lot of the trading will be with your, if you're on a blue shard, you're probably going to be with your friends or a known group or people you let in. So it, it shouldn't be as much. <clears throat> I right. need, I don't know, I need 10 iron or I need a sword. I'm just going to go find a bot that, that will sell it to me for cheap. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, marketplace, no marketplace sounds very interesting though. Like, yeah, I, I know that will sound scary to players because they imagine it in terms of, well, now if I want a potion, do I have to spam chat and then find someone and trade with them? And, uh -huh. um, there are, I think it's BDO that does where you can like set up your character to sell things, even when you're not online and things like that. Like mm -hmm. that was like, we really want to promote. Th that was Go like ahead. the old classic MMOs where like you would you would like AFK in town, put up like a shop, list your item, yeah. sell it, and then just go to sleep and then wake up the yeah. next day, see if your sh your stuff sold. <laughs> like I don't know if that's the right solution, but that's definitely more in the vein of what we're talking about, where okay. it's a re it's a it's a relationship you have with another player, even if it's a very transactional one, right. rather than oh, I just go to the UI and I open up the UI and I get these potions and it there might as well not be another human on the other side of that. Right. I think players only think about it in terms of, oh, you're taking convenience <laughs> away from me. And that's not really the goal. We just want to get back to, sure. it's a social game. That's the whole point. Right. I, and, I, and I and I can, res I mean, obviously you're not saying that 100% there's going to be no marketplace, but I can certainly see the direction that you're trying to go. You're trying to 
give the players a an experience where you're interacting you're trying to give the players a social experience rather than everything being because like too much convenience does disconnect that right like party finders yeah. and raid finders which i was going to yeah. ask you oh, what are your thoughts on on that party finders and raid finders let me just say one more thing before yes, I, I get to the, the dungeon finder because it's related is diablo 3 had a big problem with its marketplace and people said it mm. was the real money auction house yes. that actually wasn't the problem the problem was the best gear was something you just went and bought off off this auction house. You didn't have to go kill demons to get it. You just went and bought all your gear, and that just totally you know took Diablo at its at its knees. The whole point of the game is to to get loot. Um, are you going to make the best in slot items that are like you have to defeat this dragon raid boss? Are you going to make those bound? Or probably, trade? probably those would have to be bound. And then the other thing we would like to do is just have a lot of really, really rare items so that when you get a sword, it's special. And players are like, oh, wow, yeah. you have that sword. I've never seen anyone with that sword. I think the way MMOs have gotten is that everyone kind of has an expectation of, I'm going to get the best in slot, you know, in, right. for everything. But and I, again, it's taking a little bit of convenience away and it'll <laughs> feel a little painful when you really, really want that sword and it won't drop for you. But I also think it helps... Um, when you do get it, it makes it really, really exciting rather right. than something that's like, well, of course I'm going to get it. Everyone expects to get it. I love the idea of having a lot of end game chase, different chase items. Yeah. Are there going to be different BIS items as well? Like, for example, there is no sort of a thousand truce where this is this is it. There's going to yeah. be a lot of those where it's like, yeah, this is BIS for this. This is BIS for this. Is that kind of what you're thinking? I hope so. And again, with the um, with a different number of classes and stuff like that, I hope it gives us a little more room to say, well, this may not be an item you want, but your alt may want it or your pal may want it or something like that. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I worked at World of Warcraft for many years, and I know the challenge of saying, well, we're going to make two rings and they're both going to be equally good. Like players kind of math out which is the real one they want and the other one's mm -hmm. kind of considered garbo unless it's, you know. Right. Art style. Oh, yeah. So the, yes. the Dungeon Raid Finder question. Like, oh, yeah. Yes. I forgot my own question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I worked on those features a lot, so I take a lot of the blame for them. But I, you know, I don't think where they ended up was awesome because in, let's say, in, in heroic dungeons at Burning Crusade, if you had trouble with a group, what you would do is you'd sit down at that group and kind of figure out, well, what do we need to do differently? Let's right. make sure everyone understands the fights. You know, hey, I have a flask. Can I give you this flask? Maybe that'll help. Um, the problem with Dungeon Finder is if someone wipes on a boss, you, you kick them or you leave knowing that the game will immediately provide you with another group. Right. And so they're very weirdly anonymous. Like you, you don't talk to people. You barely yeah. look at their names. It feels like you're running around with a lot of bots. And so the problem they were trying to solve was a very noble one, which is dungeons are super bad, I mean, super badass, and a lot of players don't get to see them because it's so painful to put a group together. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there are better ways to do it. Maybe it comes back down to browsing for a group, or maybe you do more things with friends, or maybe we matchmake for the easier content, but there's no matchmaking for like the, you know, the harder content because right. we want you to, to try to figure it out. Gotcha. Makes sense. What about the art style? The art style you guys were talking, you didn't want it like too cartoony. Like someone asked, like, are you going to have it more realistic or cartoony? And you definitely, you you said that you definitely want something that will, you know, last the test of time. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear your inspiration behind the art style that you're going for. Because I don't know, no, no one knows what it is, but we do yeah. see some concept art that you have yeah. shown. So maybe it kind of paints a little bit of a picture. For some reason, my mind just keeps going back to it's. I feel like it's going to look similar to League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it, why, but... Yeah, I can tell you the extremes we want to avoid, which is we don't want it to be very cartoony in the way like Fortnite is or, right. or even World of Warcraft. Um, but we also... It's hard in an MMO to go super photorealistic because that generally just means players get less content. And this is a game where you want lots and lots of content. Like you can't afford to say, well, we can't make another we can't make another boss because we don't have an animator to do that because it's so hard to animate the 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 models. Right. Or we can't add another <clears throat> dungeon set because 
in order to make a dungeon set, we have to have ruined stairway number one through six, and we have to have like broken chandeliers and weapon racks for every possible art set. So I don't think it'll be super detailed in the sense of, um, I mean, what's a very, you know, game that looks like a photograph, um, you know, like Call of Duty or, or the, the, the EA sports games. I don't mm-hmm. think we're going for that. Um, but within there, that still means you could have a kind of more mature, more juvenile look. I imagine we'll be on the more mature side just because sure. the IP we're talking about, we really want to embrace um, a sense of mystery and like n- trying to understand what happened in the past and how that's going to affect the future. We care a lot about exploration. So we want people to kind of be poking around and opening the chest and looking behind the waterfalls to see what's there. So we need to have, we need to have a lot of diversity, um, but we also want to have an IP that feels Feel serious. I mean, Fortnite's right. not trying to be serious. Fortnite's right. like, you can throw anything into it. Are we going to have a lot of flexibility and leeway when it comes to character customization? Because one of the things that come with ga- with these Asian games is that, you know, it looks so real, you can literally put your own face in the, bo- in yeah. the game. Yeah. You can make your character fat. You can make them skinny, tall, all that stuff. Very voluptuous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but like... In a lot of Western games, you don't have that flexibility, mainly because a lot of Western developers want to kind of stay with the lore. We don't want our, um, our, you know, our tiger guy to look like this. Like we want him to look yeah. a certain way. We don't want a Torin to look like, you know, something other than a Torin. Yeah. Are we going to have some flexibility there, or is it going to be kind of limited? I think I think customization is super important. Like a big part of. MMOs, again, it's a social game. And so having the ability to express yourself, having another player, whether it's a a friend or a stranger, react to the way you look like, holy cow, I love that outfit you have, or I love how ridiculous your character looks like. That's cool. And I'd hate to lose that in the name of like adhering to the IP. Like, right. Players are going to be silly. Let's just let them be silly. If you really, if it really offends you as a player, well, you have blue shards you can go to and you, you won't sure. have to deal with randos. Right. Gotcha. So I'm assuming. Yeah. I don't know if we can deliver, a, but, you know, if we have more than just a human race, I don't know that we can deliver on the, the crazy level of customization in some of the Asian MMOs where right. you can recreate a K-pop star, recreate your own face. Like, um, right, right. But I think we can do a lot better in terms of deciding how you look and giving you a lot of options around hair and skin color and height (laughs) and weight and things like that. So I'm assuming based off of that, that gender locking is also something that you're not a big fan of. No, I think the, the kind of the modern way to handle gender is to let players choose the pronouns they get addressed as, and then just, you know, a lot of games will have like body a body B, or maybe you can even pick something in between. And that's kind of how you determine what you look like. Gotcha. So if I want to be a female warrior, a male warrior, I'll be able to do that to a certain degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to be a, a a ambiguously gendered warrior, that's fine too. You'll just, we'll need to know when the NPC talks to you, what do they say? Right. Got it. Um, I know we're over time here, so I'm going to just go over this last section, if you don't cool. mind. And that is with monetization. I just have a couple of questions in regards to monetization. I remember you did mention that you'll probably have like a box price or something like that. Or or I think you said either do a box price or a sub. I think that's what you said, right? During the broadcast, either or, right? First question is, I'd love to hear your thoughts on monetizing Head Start because every company does it now. And it's like, hey, if you pay a hundred dollars, you get to start three days head start. Love to yeah. hear your thoughts on that. I don't want to promise that we won't do it because maybe it's just a very common thing. As a player, it does rub me a little bit of the wrong way because okay. usually I want to get in, I want to play with my friends, or I want to get to the end game, and and it feels like it feels like what you're really saying is, look, the game costs a hundred bucks. Like, <clears> let's just be let's just be honest yeah. about it for most players, right? Um, now, th- that said, one of the things we would really love to do is not have an early access because usually what early access means is please give us some money and in return, we'll let you play the game earlier. Like we would love to just let players play the game earlier. Like, you know, right, right now we don't need the money. So rather than selling early access, we'd rather just get as many players as possible playing the game because then they'll, they'll help us figure out what works and what doesn't. Right. 
Right. So early access, you mean by that, you mean like early access launch, not like early access testing. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's a, a old school beta where anyone can just go play the game rather than go to Steam. And if you buy the game now, we'll let you in early. Gotcha. I think we'll avoid that. Gotcha. Um, I mean, overall, we don't we don't know what our monetization, <clears throat> excuse me, will be yet. It's something we have to do a lot of research on and kind of you know sure. see what works. We we want to make a triple A game that comes with a triple A budget. That means we need to make sure that we can you know pay our bills and 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 you know pay all these people who want to work on the game. Um, we don't think free to play with with microtransactions is the right approach. We just don't okay. think that will give the player experience we want and the, the audience we want. And so if you take that off the table, um, what's left are things like, you know, oh, just, just buy the box and play the game like Diablo or, or a sub model. Um, if you'd asked me two years ago, I would say sub models are kind of out, but people pay for Netties. I mean, not even Netties, Netflix subscriptions Netflix, Netflix. and um, Amazon subscriptions and, and things like that. So, you know, again, that would be a great thing to get player feedback on overall one of the things I really liked about Riot was their philosophy of we want players to feel good about spending money because they want to, not because they feel like they have to. Like we sure. want players to say, I love your game. I'm willing to give you money to get like something else in the game. Um, right. That's the that's the right approach. Okay. So permanent convenience items have been accepted, widely accepted in Path of Exile. No one looks at Path of Exile as a pay-to-win game. However, yeah. you absolutely need, if you're going to play that game long-term, you absolutely need to, need to shout out a few bucks for like the storage stuff, which isn't too bad because it is permanent, but you still kind of yeah. have to pay for that. Is, is that something that you think is acceptable when it comes to monetizing, like, uh, you know, inventory slots, but it's permanent, you just buy it once and you have it forever? Yeah. Or are you trying to stay away from that? As a player, that doesn't bother me because usually the way it works out is I play the game for a while. If I decide, hey, I love this game, I'm going to play this game a lot. It's worth it for me to have more inventory sure. just because I'm going to play the game for years. I think that feels a little better. Um, in general, I, you know, I, don't, I didn't, the, the, I'm playing through the DLC for um, Cyberpunk right now. It's awesome. And I don't mind paying for it because it's really good, but I wouldn't have bought that at the very beginning because I didn't, you know, I didn't know if I was going to play the game very long. So I kind of like that, you know, try before you buy approach where sure. players can kind of see, oh yeah, this is going to be a game I'm going to invest lots and lots of hours in, or I'm trying this out. Maybe it's not for me. Gotcha. Battle pass. Thoughts on battle passes. I think battle passes are a decent way to um, one, they give players something to do, right? Sure. If it's the kind of thing where like, hey, complete all these quests or whatever, and we'll give you this this item. And players like to fill in boxes. So I think that can be a fun thing to do. It's a decent way to say, um, um, I don't mind paying a little bit more for a little bit more speed or or, or whatever it is. Um, I would just want to make sure it, it really did feel optional. Um, sure. I, I play a lot of Marvel Snap. I have not, sorry guys, I've not spent a lot of money on that game because I never felt like I needed to. Sure, gotcha. Um, I do have one last question. I feel terrible because we've kind of gone, gone over our time here. So no, I'll no, let, one, let's do one more question. Okay, cool. It. Let me just ask you this one last question. Um, and this is a pretty simple, straightforward question. How long do you think it takes to realistically finish a brand new MMORPG? You mean as a player or as a developer? As as a developer, like to create and finish a game. Now, obviously, budget and size and team and all that stuff is factored in. But yeah. like, if we're just going to generalize everything, how long do you think? If, you know, if if I was playing Jeopardy or something and I answer a question yes. here, I would say five to 10 years, um, mm. depending on scope, depending on how much support you get. And... One of the things I love about the studio we have now is we're able to move really fast. And we can right. do that because we don't have to spend all of this time trying to get approval with everything. Right. That's what a, that's what often causes games to take a long time right. is the, you know, the big boss or the powers that be want reassurance that the game is going to be a hit. So you spend a lot of time kind of showing them the game right. and making demos and making PowerPoint decks and and talking about the game whereas right now we're just 
building the game, which is, it's, it's surprising to all of us how quickly that's going. Now, that's not to say we're going to finish the game in two years, but sure. you know, none of us want to be working on the game in te- for 10 years either. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Um, yeah. <laughs> if we could finish the game in four or five, six years, I would be thrilled. You know, we're not going to know until we get into it. Maybe blue shards are a terrible idea and we have to try something totally different. That's right. kind of the the challenge of game development. So you're not trying to hit a date, so you got to make sure the game is good. Gotcha. Gotcha. Makes sense. Perfect. Um, that's pretty much it for me. My questions. Chat, awesome. I know, I know, I did try to answer, I did try to ask Greg a few of your questions as they were coming in in chat, like I was kind of reading. But at the same time, I don't think we'll, we're going to actually have time for, I wanted to do like a quick Q&A at the end, but I don't think we're going to have time. Uh, we've already run over time and I want to be courteous to 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 my, my guest here. Greg, I really appreciate you for joining me. Uh, thank you so much to you and your team for, for making the time to do this. And I want to apologize to you guys. Sorry. I try to finish as fast as I could to get to a Q and a, but we just couldn't. Sorry. Uh, but well, you Greg, know what, Tana, let's just, we could do a Q and a again in the future. Let's, you know, love it. let some time go by, let people learn more about the game. And as they have questions, I'm happy to meet with you again and do it. I love that. I, that that's amazing. I mean, no, <laughs> no, no shots fired to, to riot. I think, you know, th- that, yeah. that team was great, but, um, this is a lot easier for me too to be able to yeah. just communicate with you openly like this. This is fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is is there any is, is there anything that you want to say before we close this out? Um, I I mean I want to thank everyone that is excited and paying attention. I've been getting so many messages, just people saying either they love the game idea or they love our approach about talking about it or both. Um, I understand it's not going to be a game everyone wants to play. I understand ev- not everyone wants our approach. I've talked to people who are like. You know, dude, let me know when the game's done. And that's fine. Um, that That is fine. But but again, thanks for the, you know, the, the attention love we've gotten already. Oh, it's been great. I mean, you have an all-star team. I have a lot of respect for you, Greg. Once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to apologize to YouTube as well as Twitch for, for coughing so much. Greg, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Big shout outs to... Um, for, to big shout outs to also Mr. Respects, who was the person behind the scenes that I was talking to. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate it. Uh, as far as the YouTube video goes, as well as the Twitch broadcast, we're going to close it out here. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Go and follow Fantastic Pixel Castle. I don't know why that's so hard for me to remember, but I will get it. Uh, as well as Ghostcrawler at Ghostcrawler on Twitter. And, and keep up with this game, guys. The best thing we could do is continue to give them support because it really does look like we've got an all-star team that has the ability to do what they want and actually is has taken the time and effort to listen to our feedback. And I think that's amazing. Greg, best of luck to you. And thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you. Talk soon.